All right. So we are uh, looking at our topic today is the church now and forever. So we're going to start out by talking about uh, church and ministry. Uh, what is the church? What is the office of ministry? And we'll conclude uh, in the second half of today's lesson by looking at uh, eschatology, uh, which, which covers uh, last things, uh, heaven and hell, uh, eternal life, so on and so forth. So we're, we're going to cover those topics today. And we'll start out by um, talking about the church. And the church, like everything else, is brought into being by the voice of God. Um, God's voice is the creative force. So we saw this uh, when we discussed how the world was created. Uh, God said, and it came to be. Uh, we also uh, saw an interesting thing in regards to God giving Adam life. There was the breath of God that made Adam alive. So you have this uh, breath and this voice or speaking of God, and these two things go together. Uh, that's even true in, in human physiology. You need uh, breath in order to speak, right? <laughs> so, um, so the church is created by the voice or breath of God. Well, how and when did this happen? Well, so in one sense, you could say uh, the church really begins with Adam and Eve, right? Uh, when, and with the voice of God, which issued forth the promise of a Savior who was to come, right? Uh, and, and Adam and Eve hearing that word and believing that word. Uh, now, what we're, going to what we're talking about, though, mainly today is the, the uh, beginning of the New Testament church, okay? So the church, the New Testament church. When does the New Testament church begin? The New Testament church begins, um, uh, well, we, one place we could uh, look at, uh, again, see, there's some different ways you could look at this. You could say, well, it began when Jesus called disciples. Um, but typically... We look at the uh, after Jesus' resurrection, uh, around the time of the ascension, and then, of course, Pentecost as this sort of this a time frame in which the church begins. So uh, we heard this text today. Uh, uh, the the John twenty was the gospel reading uh, for today, and uh, what did Jesus do? Uh, when he uh, appeared to the disciples, what was what did he say? When when? Well, we can we can look it up. I suppose. <laughs> Let's look it up. I'm trying to get you to remember here the service. Don't be afraid. Right. John, what's that? Don't be afraid. John twenty. Oh. Okay. So yeah, okay. You're all right. Um, His first words were, "Don't be afraid." Don't be afraid, and peace be with you. Peace be with you, that's it. Peace be with you, or peace to you, okay? So he says, peace to you, and, uh, and this is absolution, right? Because they have, uh, they had uh, all abandoned their Lord, uh, hidden, uh, you know, and so forth, despaired. Uh, and then he shows up back resurrected and uh, one might, if you were one of Jesus' faithless and unfaithful disciples, you might wonder, is he going to punish us, right? So it's really great that Jesus' first words are words of absolution. Peace to you. It's not sort of just peace with you as, a, as, a, as like a wish. This is like a, this is a, a blessing, right? Um, so, uh, peace to you. And then if you look at verse 21, uh, so Jesus said to them again, uh, peace to you as the father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy spirit. 
If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. So notice uh, two actions here after he says peace to you. He breathes on them and he speaks, right? So there's that, that, uh, uh, the, that uh, that we've, we've made connections before between spirit and wind and breath, right? And God's voice and speaking. That's all wrapped up in this, right? Uh, this is, uh, he breathes on them and in that breathing and speaking, he imparts the Holy Spirit to them. And he gives them the Holy Spirit for this particular purpose uh, to forgive sins and withhold forgiveness. And we talked about that when we discussed confession, right? Um, so, point here, though, is in this breathing on them and speaking, Jesus is instituting the office of the ministry. Jesus is calling his disciples to be his voice in the world, to speak his words, so what happens next? Well, we have the ascension of Jesus. Uh, at this point, the disciples themselves are a little church, right? But, the, but uh, then there's the ascension, and Jesus tells them to wait for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 2, we have the fulfillment of that. Uh, if we go to Acts chapter 2, we can just kind of scan that. I'm not going to read every word here. Um, but if you kind of scan that, uh, what you see here is uh, the disciples are all together. There's, uh, there is a mighty rushing wind and tongues of fire. The disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit. They begin preaching, and everyone is hearing them in their own language. Um and then Peter steps forward and he preaches the, this awesome sermon. Uh, 3,000 people are added to the church. So from 12 minus 1 and then a jump to 3,000 just like that. And uh, Pentecost is one of those great days that we celebrate in the church calendar during the church year. It's coming up here in just a few Sundays and uh, after the Easter season. And we'll be celebrating Pentecost. Uh, notice a couple of things, though, that happen here at Pentecost. There is a mighty rushing wind. Um, again, the, the, we have that, that uh, connection between spirit and breath and wind. And so God's creative breath is here. But it's, this is all taking place in the context of the disciples preaching. So we have the breath, the spirit, and the word, the preaching, together. And that's how the church comes into being. That's the beginning of the church. If you go to Acts 2.42, you get a little description of the early church. Uh, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Uh, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So, if you look at uh, 242, what four things was the early church devoted to? The teaching. So the apostles' teaching. Mm -hmm. Okay, what is that? Fellowship. Okay, well, so, okay, well, fellowship. We can list them all out and we'll describe them. <laughs> fellowship. Breaking of bread. Breaking of bread. And prayer. Okay. 
and the the prayers. Okay, so a couple of things here. The apostles' teaching uh, would be the equivalent to the Word of God. And we know this, remember, we, that, that Jesus had made promises to the apostles, right? That he would lead them into all truth, that he would cause them to remember everything that he had taught them, so that the Spirit would guide their words and so forth. So this is why uh, the early church is devoted to the apostles' teaching, right? And we also discussed that the reason why the New Testament books are included in the canon is because we can uh, tie them to an apostle. So the apostolic teaching by inspiration of the Holy Spirit is the Word of God, right? Second, the fellowship. This is, uh, this is koinonia, unity, oneness. Okay, and, uh, and that's something that you need to be devoted to. It takes work. Why? Why does it take work to maintain unity in the church? Because we're all sinners. Because we're all sinners, right? So this is something that we have to actively pursue, right? This is something that we have to work at. Just like a husband and a wife have to work at their marriage relationship, right? Uh, so also... In the life of the church, we have to work at fellowship. So fellowship, by the way, is not that we get together and have potlucks. Okay? You know, sometimes you have a church has a fellowship committee and they just put on meals and stuff like that. You know, actually the true fellowship committee is the board of elders. <laughs> All right? Because their, their uh, work is more focused on the life of the church and the unity of the body. Right? What's the breaking of bread? The Lord's Supper. Yeah, this is the Lord's Supper. Uh, this is a common shorthand in the New Testament for the Lord's Supper. It, it recalls Jesus' action of, uh, of uh, when he had taken the bread, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, right? Well, this becomes kind of a common shorthand uh, way of referring to the Lord's Supper, the breaking of the bread. So this is, uh, uh, they're, they're devoted to the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And then the prayers. And uh, a key word there is the. What would that tell us? Of, why, why would it be important to know that it's the prayers and not just to prayer? The right prayers. Pardon me? The correct prayers. The right prayers. Well, the prayers I think they, you're getting close. I think the prayers that we, that they, they, Hear from Jesus. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, so what we're what what this is indicating here in the prayers is that there is some sort of established liturgy, right? Um, there's 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 a, a a corpus or a collection of prayers that are said by the body. So this is not just ex corde from the heart prayer that they're getting together and having prayer meetings and all taking turns praying, there is the prayers, or you could even just say the liturgy almost, okay? Uh, there is, and this is probably carried over from uh, temple and uh, synagogue worship, right? Uh, there, probably a lot of the prayers that are being prayed are the Psalms, right? So there's, there's definitely, there's what, what we're seeing here is there's an orderliness and, a, and some sort of liturgical form going on. Now, it's probably not, certainly not, exactly the same as what we have today. But it is an indication that the kind of orderliness and reverence that we have in worship is something that's present from the very beginning. Right? It's not just everyone doing whatever comes to mind or comes to heart. So those are the four things. And then you have this description of the life of the church which um, which talks about how they are uh, caring for one another, uh, living communally, um, probably in a lot, large part because of persecution. Um, and, uh, and they're willingly um, uh, doing whatever it takes to take care of those who are needy in their midst. 
Okay. Now some people look at this and they go, "Well, oh, this sounds awful lot like like socialism, right?" <laughs> um, we have to remember this is a voluntary thing. Right? This is something that they are voluntarily doing, not something that they are being forced to do. Right? This is this is brother and sister in Christ taking care of brother and sister in Christ, right? Out of out of freedom, not obligation. So that's that's important there. Okay, so. Uh, Acts 2 then shows how the New Testament church came into being. How does, the, uh, how does God continue to bring the church into being today? What is that? The same way. The same way, right? And it starts with the voice of God. Okay? Uh, pastors called and ordained pastors, proclaiming God's word, preaching, teaching, and administering the sacraments. Um, that's how you became part of the church, right? Um, someone baptized you. Someone preached to you. Someone taught you, right? Um, uh, so Jesus works through his word spoken, taught, uh, given by pastors to create the church. He even works through the voice of this guy. Right? <laughs> I do this in confirmation. The kids love it. <laughs> um, so it's, now I want to say that this, the reason why we can just take this away is because it's not about the man, right? It's about the office. It's not about this guy. It's about the office that he that he bears, right? That he's called to. He's called to proclaim Christ's word and, in, and administer the sacraments for the sake of the church. Um, all right, so uh, let's look then at the duties of the pastor. Some passages here. Uh, Matthew 28, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the end of the age. John 20, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And then 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, of course, these passages all, all are descriptive of the apostolic ministry, right? These are... Uh, Jesus' words to the apostles, although uh, one could argue here in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, by this time we have other pastors besides the apostles, so this would be a part of the commission to those pastors. But what we knew, know from the New Testament, what we know from church history, is that the apostles chose and ordained other men by the laying on of hands to continue this ministry. Okay? Okay. Now, of course, no one has the same authority and promises that the apostles had with regard to inspiration. Um, pastors carry on, uh, pastors are actually carrying on the apostolic ministry in the sense that they're to proclaim the teaching of the apostles and administer the means of grace. So we confess in, in the uh, creed, we believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. Okay? So I'm carrying on the apostolic ministry, not in the sense that I have the same authority as the apostles, but in the sense that I am proclaiming the apostles' word and carrying out the functions of the office of the ministry that the apostles uh, were first called to, to, uh, to administer. All right? So if we look at this, uh, what we have here then, uh, uh, just right from the beginning, as far as duties of a pastor, uh, we're to, 
the pastors to be making other disciples, baptizing, teaching, which would include also preaching, uh, forgiving sins, uh, withholding forgiveness, which would be church discipline, and uh, administering the Lord's Supper. Uh, um, if you look at the ordination rite, um, these are the things that the pastor vows to do. He vows to preach the word faithfully, instruct both young and old in the chief articles of the Christian doctrine, forgive the sins of those who repent and never divulge the sins confessed, minister faithfully to the sick and dying, admonish and encourage the people to a lively confidence in Christ and holy living, adorn the office of the holy ministry with a holy life, be diligent in the study of Holy Scripture, and be constant in prayer for those under his care. So that's a, a good long list of pastoral duties and responsibilities there. Um, we could also include other uh, less central, well, let's put it this way, other uh, related uh, and, and, and importantly related um, responsibilities. Obviously, if you're going to be preaching and administering the sacrament, you're going to be leading worship, right? Um, uh, you're going to also need to take the Word of God and bring it to bear in different situations, right? And, uh, if you have sick and homebound uh, who can't come to church to receive the Lord's Supper, you're going to, the pastor's going to go and visit them and bring them the Lord's Supper. Um, Performing weddings, funerals, and other services. These are opportunities to uh, bring the Word of God to bear in important uh, times in people's life, right? Whether that's, uh, you know, getting married or, uh, or uh, you know, at, their, at their, uh, their deathbed or ministering to the grieving loved ones at a funeral. Obviously, because we are dealing with uh, the Word of God and we're, we're trying to teach and preach and make disciples, uh, there's going to be a lot of studying and research involved in this. A pastor should be a, a constant student of the Word. He should be you know, trying his best to keep up to date with uh, theological trends and evaluating them and judging them in light of the Scriptures um, and those sorts of things. Also, uh, counseling, um, people with uh, troubled marriages or people who are going through difficult times or, you know, any number of situations that could come up uh, may be an opportunity for the pastor to bring the Word of God to bear in a counseling situation. And, 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 and I would say, um, when, when we talk about pastoral counseling, we're not talking about psychotherapy, right? I'm not trained in that. Um, if I encounter somebody who needs that service, I will refer them, right? But when I, well, we're talking about biblical counseling. We're talking about bringing the Word of God to bear in whatever uh, situation you, you have going on in your, in your life. And then attending congregational leadership meetings. Uh, this is so that we can make sure that what we're doing or the direction that we're heading as a congregation, well, there's a lot of freedom to go one way or another. Uh, there are certain things we're not free to do. We're not free to do anything contrary to God's word, right? So the pastor needs to be there to, you know, make sure that uh, we're doing everything uh, decently in accordance with God's word. So, you know, for example, um, you know, we had a building program a few years ago, and uh, I said, you know, very clearly, whether we build or not build, God has not commanded us one way or another, <laughs> right? And it's not my decision. That's our decision as a congregation. Um, but how we conduct our capital campaigns, the way that we present these things, we need to be guided by the word of God and not, uh, we, we had a little bit of a, well, I won't go into all that, but it, it was, we, we had bad advice, let's put it this way, we had bad advice on how to run a capital campaign a lot of really slick, manipulative stuff that was fed to us and said, you need to do this if you're going to raise money. And, you know, thank God I was there <laughs> and, and was able to say, let's not do that. 
all right? <laughs> um, so that's part of that, right? The pastor needs to be there uh, to, to keep tabs on some of those sorts of things. So um, that's a list of responsibilities of, and duties of the pastors. What, what, any questions on that? All right. Um, pastors are, I like to say this, pastors are uh, delivery men, servants, stewards, messengers, shepherds, or we could say under shepherds of the good shepherd. Uh, pastors are not kings or slave drivers or CEOs. I think this is really important because a lot of um, leadership trends in the church today, especially church growth type leadership trends, uh, really have redefined the pastoral ministry in terms of sort of a, a business model. And uh, I mean, I hear this all the time at pastors gatherings and you know, district conferences and stuff, you know, this, this, whole, this, this whole way of framing pastoral leadership in terms of the congregation or potential members are described almost like customers, you know, and, and pastors are sort of like, you know, uh, vision casting leaders who are going to try to, you know, bring more customers in I mean, this is a really a totally wrong-headed way of viewing the pastoral ministry. Now, there are certainly some great, uh, you know, practices and, and things that we can bring over from the business world as far as, you know, standards of excellence and, you know, those sorts of things, how to relate to people and those sorts of things. But you cross the line when you begin to think of the, the people as customers, right? Because if... if What's the saying in the business world? The customer is always right. right. But in the church, no. <laughs> no, we're all sinners and we're coming here to receive forgiveness. And so, um, and so that, that can't, we can't make those, the same kinds of, we can't approach pastoral ministry the same way we approach uh, business leadership. And when we do, we may, we, there's a lot of problems. There's a lot of problems. Uh, and that's been a, a, a sort of an infection in the church for quite a while now. Um, so, you know, thankfully here at All Saints, I have, a, I have leaders who uh, make it their business to try to remove as much um, uh, administration off of my plate as possible so I can focus on pastoral ministry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So a, a, a little boy once brought a friend to church, and as he, uh, they walked in the door, the friend saw a man dressed all in black. And, uh, and who's that guy, the friend asked, and the little boy replied, that's my pastor, but when he puts on his dress, he's Jesus. <laughs> that's, not a bad, that's not a bad way of, of thinking about it, right? Um, who, the pastor is there to represent Christ to you. To speak Christ's word and administer Christ's gifts to you. He's not there to be the vision casting CEO leader. He's not the, uh, the guy who's supposed to say, I'm in charge and you're going to listen to me or else. His power in, and his authority are that of the word of God and, and nothing else. The Bible also lets, uh, sets forth qualifications for pastors. Uh, 1 Timothy 3 if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, oh, by the way, let me, let me say this. There are a number of different words that are used throughout the New Testament that refer to the office of the ministry or the pastoral office, okay? Obviously, one of those is pastor, okay? And that's sort of a, uh, sort of like an agricultural image, right, of, of a shepherd and sheep, right? You see your pastor and pasture, right, <laughs> in that, okay? Um, but one of the other terms is overseer, sometimes translated as bishop, okay? Uh, another word that you find in the New Testament quite frequently uh, that refers to the pastoral office is elder. Uh, it's interesting because we call the laymen, the committee of laymen, elders. Um, 
And that's kind of a weird thing how we got there. That's not really the most biblical language to use for that group of people. That they would be more like deacons in the New Testament, okay? The, the, the diaconal office. Uh, whenever you see the word elder in the New Testament, it's usually, oh, say, almost always or always uh, a reference to the pastoral office, okay? to the office of the ministry. Um, so, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now, the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that the children obey him with proper respect. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, a little further along, he must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, the things that you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will be qualified to teach others. And 2 Timothy 2, again, uh, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. So you got a couple of, if you look at these and take these all together, you've got a couple of categories. You've got spiritual qualifications and you've got personal qualifications, right? In regards to spiritual qualifications, the pastor is to be apt or able to teach. He is to be spiritually mature, not a recent convert. Uh, qualified to teach. Um, correctly handles the word of truth and uh, must be an approved workman. And uh, uh, this would be, this indicates that there has always been, uh, uh, and we see this all throughout church history too, an external call to the pastoral ministry. Now this takes different forms in different places, right? But, the, but always uh, the pastor is called by the church. Not necessarily the congregation that he's serving, but by the church. In other words, um, it, the pastors are not made pastors because they have a feeling in their heart that I'm a pastor. Or I feel like God's leading me to be a pastor. There must be some external call. Okay? Um, you know, uh, you have that in, in the early on in the New Testament with the apostles directly calling people. Right? Um, you have different systems, whether that's, uh, you know, uh, the bishops or other local clergy involved or the congregation calling, but always there's something from outside, okay, that's calling the pastor into the office, all right? And in the best scenarios, that means that, they, that, they've, that the pastor's been, you know, examined, his theology's been examined, he's been examined in light of these qualifications and so forth, and, uh, and has had the, the stamp of approval of the church placed upon him. Yeah. Personal qualifications, above reproach, that is, the pastor should have a godly reputation, the husband of one wife, uh, temperate, that is, not easily angered, self-controlled, respectable, Hospitable, that would be that he enjoys and likes being with people. Uh, not given to drunkenness, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Manages his family well and his children and is reliable. And we would add one final qualification, an important one. He must be male. All right. Um, you notice even in all of these passages that the, the pastor is referred to as he the descriptions, uh, husband of one wife, and so forth, that's all assumes, those, those passages assume that the pastor is going to be male. Why would that, might that make sense in light of what the pastor is called to do? Get the light going. Okay. <laughs> what did we just say the pastor is when he puts on his robes? What did the little boy say? Jesus. He's Jesus. Okay, so you're representing, God. the pastor's representing Christ. Mm -hmm. Was Christ a boy or a girl? 
Yeah. All right? Yeah. Jesus was a male, and it thus makes sense that we would have males who would represent him. All right? And by the way, Jesus being male was not an accident of biology, right? He is the Father's Son from eternity. Okay? Um, and, uh, and so this is, uh, you know, you get some of this weird stuff with some of these uh, liberal denominations where you have uh, Christ, Sophia, and we can think about Jesus as a woman, and uh, this is not how this works. As a, as a black woman. <laughs> what, yeah, in the shack? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was the, that was the father. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, he wasn't Christ portrayed as a, a hippie type of I don't know. Yeah. nature lover? I don't know. I didn't write that. It just went... Yeah, I just read the book. I'm like, eh, we're really reaching here. Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's not the greatest book in, in the world. <laughs> All right, um, so you know this comes sometimes comes up. We we know that there are many many denominations where we have female clergy. Uh, we live in a day and age where uh, we've had feminism kind of roll through. Uh, you know, the equality of the sexes has been stressed. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of lot more resistance to the idea of an all-male clergy. Um, so it's you know worthwhile for us to explore this a little bit. But there are other uh, resources in your handouts and uh, book recommendations on this topic if you want to dive further. Um, a couple of passages here: First Corinthians 14. As in all the congregations of the saints, uh, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak. Uh, but must be in submission as the law says. Now, of course, this is referring to the worship service and to preaching, okay? It's not saying that a woman can't ask questions in a Bible class or something like that, all right? Um, uh, but we have here, um, uh, the, the word for speak here is really uh, the, the Greek word, lends and tends and trends more toward public speaking, right? Authoritatively before the congregation. Now, by the way, this would have been totally, uh, you know, uh, culturally accepted, especially in Gentile lands where you had female priests and, and clergy in other, uh, in other religions, right? Uh, so this is actually kind of countercultural, you know, some people will try to write this off and say, well, Paul's just making accommodations to his own day. Actually, no. Um, this is kind of radical to, to say that a woman shouldn't preach, uh, uh, shouldn't speak publicly in the, uh, the assembly, all right? Um, the, the woman is to be in submission. That is... You know, again, sometimes we get these negative connotations with submission, but actually Jesus submits to the Father, and that's not a negative thing, right? So when we talk about submission, we're not talking about the men putting the women under the thumb. We're talking about the women saying, uh, letting the men serve them, letting the men uh, be the spiritual leaders, uh, serving and caring for them, all right? Um, so, you know, as... Uh, you know, Paul says this to, to wives in Ephesians 5, that as uh, the church submits to Christ, so also uh, the wife should submit to her husband, right? And this is not a negative thing. This is a, a positive thing, actually. An ordered relationship where, um, where everyone is being cared for by someone who has an, an office and a calling to do so, right? And it's just part of God's arrangement that the women are cared for by the men, both uh, physically and spiritually within the church, okay? Uh, 1 Timothy 2, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or ex exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. Again here, let the, the men serve them. <laughs> Stop trying to be the leaders, but, and let the men serve as the spiritual leaders in the congregation. Um, I have a friend who was about to be uh, B 
be ordained as a woman pastor. She got a little online argument with another friend of mine who was a young seminary student uh, in the Missouri Synod, and uh, she thought she was going to take him to task, right, uh, for his, uh, his views on male-only clergy. And one of the things that uh, he said to her was, why would you want to be a pastor? It's beneath you. And it totally changed her whole... She's like, well, what do I say to that? <laughs> Um, you know, if you, if you look at uh, the creation account, uh, everything is not good until the woman comes. And the man is called to love and serve and care for his wife. She's put on a pedestal. Same thing Jesus does with the church, right? His bride, the church. And the same thing with the women in the congregation. The men are to be the servants. And the women are to receive that service. It's actually beneath them to take on the role of the servant. Um, if we, and this just reminds us all that this whole discussion of service in the church should not be about power and who's got the power, right? Jesus said, uh, um, you know, that, 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 uh, that we should, that the greatest among you is the lowliest, right? Um, that uh, that uh, we should be not competing for power, but competing to serve each other, to outdo one another in, in serving each other. Not, not for earthly glory, but just because that's what we're called to do, right? To serve each other. And God calls us to do that in different ways as men and women. I, I actually read something really good the other day that stated, women weren't created to do everything a man can do. Mm -hmm. Women were created to do everything a man can't do. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, there's very, that's very much, you know, there's very much this complementarity, right? And, uh, and so, right. So men are the ones who are called to stand in the place of Christ, who is also male, and take care of and serve the women. Um, okay, so now you've heard all about what I'm called to do. <laughs> Here's what you're called to do. In relation to the pastor. Uh, verse Corinthians 9. The Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Uh, Galatians 6. Anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So first of all, uh, let's point out those two passages. Uh, what do the hearers owe their pastors according to those first two passages? Their living. An income. Mm -hmm. All right. Why? Why would that, why would um, God reveal this as an important thing for the hearers? If a pastor had to do something else to earn a living, he couldn't just devote himself to preaching God's word. Right. So, it's for your good, right? If the pastor can earn his living from the gospel, mm -hmm. from his service to the people, that means he can devote full time to that activity. That means he can be there to pray with you when you're in the hospital. He can be there to counsel you when you're going through troubled times in your marriage or whatever else. He can, he can put the time of effort and a study required to preach a good sermon in to preach a good sermon or to teach a good Bible study, right? Um, uh, so this is the ideal, the ideal situation is that the pastor can earn his living from uh, those whom he is serving so that he can serve them full time. Now there are sometimes uh, small, small, tiny congregations who can't afford to pay their pastor. We have worker priests. Um, uh, uh, where the pastor works part-time uh, to supplement his income and serves part-time. Now, you know, God certainly can bless that, but it does hinder and hamper his ministry because it means that there's times that he's not available to be there for you when you are in need. It means that he may have to compromise on the amount of time he can devote to his study of the Word and sermon and Bible study preparation. 
So if you ever find yourself in the situation where you're a member of a congregation that is, you know, struggling to, to pay its pastor, um, you know, this is worth the, uh, uh, this is worth um, sacrificial giving for to make that happen, right? Um, all right. Uh, the uh, First Timothy five: the elders who direct the affairs of the church are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. First uh, Thessalonians five: we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love, because of their work, and live in peace with each other. So, what about these two verses? What do these indicate? Are the responsibilities of the people towards their pastor. Double honor, he mentions. Why? Why? Why double honor? <laughs> because they're bringing the gospel. Yeah, they're through, through them, God is working salvation. <laughs> the most important thing in the world. You know, yeah. Like the most important thing in your life, God is giving you through their ministry. Um, uh, what does it mean to honor? Well, it means to, to listen and comprehend and learn, right? Because that's what the pastor wants for you, right? He wants you to hear God's word, to learn, to grow in your faith, right? If you want to honor your pastor, that's the way to do it, right? Be interested in this stuff. Be dedicated to it. Uh, study and learn and be and be eager to receive that ministry. Um, uh, when you so when you, you know when you listen with intent when and with concentration and try to comprehend and apply what the pastor is preaching and teaching, you're honoring your pastor. Uh, and to respect again, because he says here, because of their work. And then finally, obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. So obedience and submission. Um, what I would, the way I often describe this is, you know, this doesn't mean that the pastor couldn't go off the rails. But what it means is, I think, is, is that you give your pastor the benefit of the doubt, even when he says something that's challenging to you and that maybe is hard for you to accept. The very least you say, I'm, I'm not going to just reject it because I don't like it. I'm going to test and approve, right? Um, but, but giving him the benefit of the doubt, okay? Um, listening to him and trying to, uh, and also putting the best construction on things, right? And, 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 you know, now it is possible that I or any other pastor could go off the rails and preach or teach or command something uh, false. And that would be the exception, of course, to this obedience and submission, right? Um, in which case you would do like the, the apostles and acts and you would say, we obey God rather than men. But it, apart from that, you know, Listen, you know, listen to him. Give him the benefit of the doubt. Assume that maybe, even if he's saying something to you that challenges you, maybe he's he's telling me something I need to hear. You know, I encounter so many people who just the minute the minute I say something that they don't like, walk out the door. You know, gone. Right? They don't allow themselves to be challenged. They don't. They don't start with the assumption that the pastor is, is bringing Christ's word to them. Um, so I think, and I think that's, that's the way we should start. By the way, every pastor should have a pastor too. <laughs> right? Um, so I'm including myself in this. Yeah. All right. I mean, what you're, you've been teaching just today about what a pastor should be it could be controversial about not being a woman and yeah and there are yeah. women out there that think that they should be allowed to do a job they're not equipped to do or mm -hmm. a job that god has not called them to do so 
I mean, I've always been that person. Like, I don't want to go to war. I don't want to preach. <laughs> well, I think, you know, I think this is a good point you, you, you're kind of hinting at here. It's not that a woman is not capable. Right. Right? This is not what we're saying. Or that the, the woman is somehow less capable or less worthy. It has to do with the God's ordering. Right. right? God's ordering of, of life in the church. Yeah. Um, so I think that's important to, to, to say. Yeah. All right. So uh, how else can you honor and respect your pastor? Well, pray for him. <laughs> Uh, pastors face a lot of temptations, and they have important work. Um, encourage and compliment your pastor. And I'm not there saying that to seek, you know, your compliments. But I'll, let me tell you, from personal experience, a lot of times the only voices you hear are the negative voices, and it can make a world of difference to have one positive voice among those negative voices. It, it's, it can make the difference between you wanting to get up in the morning and come in or not. And I've been through those times where I did not want to be there. And that's kind of what he's saying here. You know, obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden. For that would be of no benefit to you. If the pastor doesn't, is, is so frustrated and upset he doesn't want to serve you, that's not your benefit. <laughs> right? So, you're, you know, it doesn't mean you're going to make up things and just to stroke his ego. It means, you know, let him know that he's appreciated every once in a while. Or if, you, if he preaches something in this sermon, you say, wow, that was really important, or, or something, I learned something, say it, you know? Because again, sometimes it seems like you only, the only voices you hear are the negative voices. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, consider his needs, help him, volunteer, help out at church, you know, those are all things you can do to honor, honor your pastor. All right, uh, let's also quickly run through the church. Boy, we're taking too much time. All right. There are different ways we use the word church. Some people use the word church to refer to the church building. Like I say, that was a really pretty church, but that's not what we mean by the Holy Christian Church. Others will uh, use the word church to describe what we do on Sunday, right? I go to church. Um, uh, but that's not what we mean by the Holy Christian Church. Uh, some people will use the word church to refer to the local congregation. Like I go to All Saints Lutheran Church. But that's not uh, most properly what we mean by the Holy Christian Church either. Uh, some people will use the word church to refer to a denomination. Like I belong to the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. But even that is not properly uh, a reference to the one holy uh, church. Um, so these are not properly church. They have that name because of their association with the true church. The Holy Christian Church is the communion of saints, the total number of those who believe in Christ. Okay? So a couple of things, uh, thinking about this definition. Uh, first of all, the church is people. Not buildings or denominational structures or activities. It's people. Uh, these are holy people or saints. I should uh, help us to understand that. The Bible, when it refers to uh, saints, is not referring to these especially holy people who did, you know, a super, you know, works of super irrigation in their life and now have this special status like super Christians, right? That's kind of where the Roman Catholic Church uses that. When, we, when the New Testament uses the word saints, it's referring to any and all believers in Christ. That means you all are saints. All right? You're saints. Uh, now, there are some particular saints that we remember uh, and give thanks to God for their example or, or great things that, they, that God did through them in their lives. Right? But, but uh, they, are, they are not saints because they did those things. They're saints because they were made saints by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, so, um, 
So the church is holy people who are holy, who are saints, because they believe in Christ. Sometimes you also see the word Catholic. Uh, sometimes the creed is rendered one holy Christian apostolic church. The original wording was one holy Catholic and apostolic church. The word Catholic means universal and, uh, and indicates this reality of the church, right? That this is a, that this is a, a um, the sum total of all who believe in Jesus Christ anywhere in the world, right? And also the ones who have already died and are with Christ now, all right? So, you know, there was this um, church in Texas that had this little ad campaign at one point. It said, we are not your grandfather's church. And I said, well, then you're not the church, okay? Because my grandfather, who is with our Lord in heaven right now, is just as much a part of the, the one holy Christian apostolic church as any of us, right? Uh, we have a deep, Adam and Eve, <laughs> are part of this one holy Christian and apostolic church, all right? Um, and every believer uh, from Adam and Eve forward. And unless the Lord returns uh, in the next few moments, uh, there will be other saints added to the church, right? <laughs> so, um, so we are part of the one church that has existed throughout all times and places. What a wonderful and beautiful reality, right? Uh, there are different descriptions of the, of the Holy Christian Church. In Ephesians 2, the, the church is described as citizens, as saints, as members of a household, as a holy temple. Uh, John 10, uh, the church is uh, described as sheep that are cared for by the Good Shepherd. Uh, in 1 Peter 2, the church is described as chosen, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. That, you know, indicates a large group, right? A whole nation, right? Um, a priesthood that they have access uh, to, to God, direct access to God. Uh, Galatians 6 refers to the church as the household of faith. That brings in the whole family imagery, that we are a family, that we're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And in Ephesians 1, the church is described as the body of Christ, which indicates both the, uh, the reality that we are one with Christ, we are his body. And also, there's some discussion there of the fact that there are different parts of the body, and that every part of the body is important and essential. And we don't despise any, uh, and ought not to despise any uh, Christian who is part of that body of the church. All right. Um, how is the church different uh, from other communities? Well, the creed helps us with that. Uh, the church is one. That is, it is the only community in which there is salvation, for it is the gathering of all who believe in Christ. It is holy. Uh, the church is the only community where forgiveness is given, thus making its members holy. It is uh, Christian. It is the only community where Christ and not a sinful man is the head. We could also say Catholic, uh, which we described a minute ago, that the church is universal, consisting of all believers uh, past, present, and future, both in heaven and on earth. And the church is apostolic. Uh, only the church is founded on the testimony of Jesus' apostles, whose witness to his teaching and work and saving death and resurrection is preserved in the scriptures and proclaimed to all nations. So these uh, descriptors of the church in the creed Help us to understand how the church is a distinct and separate and unique kind of community. Finally, we could also talk about the church as gathered. Um, they are gathered around the means of grace which create and sustain the church. I mean, even the very word 
church means gathered ones. Okay. Now, you know, this is why, by the way, uh, we refused to completely shut down during COVID. All right. I mean, there were a couple of instances where we where we were concerned about specific infections that might spread, uh, where we had you know positive cases who had had contact with other members and so forth. And we we took a week off or a week, two weeks off, but we refused to shut down completely. And the reason is, is because uh, if we completely shut down, if we completely stop gathering, we're kind of stepping outside of what it even means to be church in, in very important ways. Um, you know, the church is gathered around the means of grace. And if we stop doing that, what does that mean? <laughs> in, in, in some ways, now certainly, you know, there can be times of persecution where the church is underground and is gathering in smaller groups and secretly, or even maybe where the only church gathered is the people in one's own home, right? Um, and the Lord can sustain that. But the God's ideal and, and what God intends is for the church to be gathered. The church is also imperishable. Uh, Jesus says the gates of hell cannot stand against it. Uh, Jesus is the head uh, uh, and the church cannot be conquered because uh, she is under the headship of the victorious one. And the church is necessary for salvation. Again, not saying the institution, okay, but the one holy Christian apostolic church is necessary for salvation. Why? Which one of you would be Christians today apart from the church? Even your own parents or grandparents who spoke the word to you, right? Someone had to preach to you. Somebody had to teach you. Somebody had to baptize you. And in that sense, the church is absolutely necessary for salvation. Um, both in the creation of faith and in the sustaining of faith. When people wander away from the church long enough, they are separating themselves from the gifts of God which keep them united to Christ. And I see that happen uh, frequently, and it's and a sad thing that that has happened even during COVID, that, um, that families uh, who through fear have withdrawn from church uh, now... Um, just no longer feel like it's important anymore and they just stop coming because they've absented themselves from those means which create and sustain that faith in them in, in one of the most dire moments yeah 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 that's what the devil wants it was actually turning into god's word that stopped me from going totally I have a high anxiety. So it was getting into God's word every day and being in a church group that kept me from a lot, from my anxiety from getting out of control. Mm -hmm. Because I kept seeing bad people. The masks, you know, bad people wear masks. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. 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 Uh, another thing, aspect of the church we could talk about is that the the church is both hidden and visible. Um, the true church, as we said, consists of only those who have faith in the heart. We can't see in anyone's hearts, and so in a certain sense, uh, we can't be absolutely certain who are and who are not Christians. Now, uh, we do have the outward marks. We see people who are gladly hearing and learning the word of God, who are making use of the sacraments. But, uh, you know, Jesus and the apostles all taught that there are also hypocrites who outwardly appear uh, to be uh, Christians who are, who, are, who are gladly hearing and learning the word of God and making use of the means of grace, and yet are not uh, truly believers. And so in this sense, the church is hidden, right? I mean, I, I look at you all, and I believe... <laughs> 
that you are all Christians and you have the marks of Christians, but I can't look into anybody's heart, right? Um, uh, and there are also, what that means is that there are going to be some who we are surprised are not going to be there in heaven. And there are going to be some who we are surprised are there in heaven. Because there's also some who by their outward life uh, don't appear to be Christians, and yet uh, the Lord has in some way uh, reached them, or maybe in their last moments he has reached them, and they die in faith. And, uh, and they will be there and maybe will be surprised that they're there, right? So in that sense, the church is hidden. Only God knows the full number of those who are his, all right? Um, but, so the, the, it's hidden in that sense, but also visible in this sense, that we can see the means by which the church is created. We can see the word being preached. We can see the sacraments being administered. We know that God's word is efficacious. We know that baptism does what Jesus says it does, and the Lord's Supper does what it says, what Jesus says it does. Uh, we can, um, so we can see these things, and we know that wherever those things are being done, uh, faithfully and in accordance with God's words, we know that there are Christians there, even if we don't know which ones are truly believers and which ones are not. Um, so when I look out, uh, at the church from the pulpit on a Sunday morning, I know the church is present, at least part of the church, right? But I don't know who each and every, if, if each and every one of those people gathered are truly believers. So the, the church is both, in that sense, hidden and visible. Does that make sense? Um. How did you become a member of the church? Well, uh, Luther's explanation of the third article of the Creed, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. So this is how you were called the faith. You were called by the gospel, enlightened with his gifts, sanctified, uh, that is made holy and kept in the faith. All right. Uh, now, notice what Luther says next in regard to the church. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. So, notice he repeats the same things, right? All your brothers and sisters in Christ, every other uh, believer was called the same way you were. The difference in the reality of the church uh, is that it, uh, Luther adds a word here, right? Uh, we have uh, called, enlightened, sanctified, kept. Here we have calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies. So here... Uh, the, the addition here is gathered, right? That's what makes, uh, takes one uh, from the individual believer to the, the corporate, uh, corporate church. So, so we, we need to understand that the church is not properly individual people having a faith relationship with Jesus all on their own. All right? Um, the church is gathered. God wants us to be together. He wants us to serve each other, but also to receive his gifts together. If you look in the New Testament, sometimes it's uh, challenging when you're reading in English because we don't distinguish between the plural you and the singular you. And so we, in our individualistic mindset, often read those yous as me. When in, re when in reality, almost every time the Bible is describing Christ's gifts to you, it should be translated y'all, right? As I learned in Texas and I continue to learn here, right? Um, we should put the y'alls in, I think, uh, so that we know that these are corporate promises, right? These are our, our promises to the gathered church, not just to the individual Christian. It is God's will that we be gathered. 
And what has Satan done in this last year? Yeah, that's exactly right. Tried Satan has tried to, had to, has tried to, you know, yeah, part of this is the fact that I think uh, our individualistic age, uh, even many Christians see their Christian faith as something that's just between them and Jesus. Right. And even some of our civil leaders who are Christians don't understand why it's necessary to gather. Because even our Christian leaders see Christian faith as something between them and Jesus. And for the sake of everybody's health, we don't need to gather because I'm, me and Jesus, we're just fine. And you and Jesus can be just fine too, all right. So you know, part of this is is that uh, is this this rampant individualism that we have, okay? Uh, so I think that in some cases there's an agenda against the church, or at the very least a lack of respect for the church. But in other cases, it's even Christian believers who don't get it, right? Um, and uh, and and so we but we need to understand that uh, there is something essential about the gathering of the church. All right. So uh, we're called, we're gathered, we're enlightened. That means that we are uh, learning and growing and being taught by our Lord. We're sanctified. The Holy Spirit has made us holy uh, and law is also leading us to good works. And we are kept by the word and sacrament in this, uh, in this faith. Uh, even as we confess the scriptural definition of the church, we're confronted with the reality of hundreds of different denominations who te whose teachings differ dramatically. Uh, scripture teaches us how to approach this difficult is issue. And you've got this listed in there. Uh, first of all, uh, Jesus is very clear that, that false teachers are a reality that the church is going to be faced with. Um, we should expect that that's going to be, uh, that, that there are going to be false teachers in the church. Uh, well, uh, so that means then that we, we should, right from the beginning, know that we need to be discerning. Right? Uh, the church is to teach the whole counsel of God, all things. Uh, we are not allowed to pick and choose or decide what's important and what's not. Okay? Um, uh, we can't just be silent on those issues that uh, are unpopular. All right? That, and, and if you are going to a church that is silent on certain issues because they're unpopular, certain issues that the scriptures speak clearly about, that's a problem. Uh, every Christian has the responsibility to remain faithful to God's word. Nobody can say, well, you know, uh, uh, I know I, I apostatized, but it was the false teacher's fault. No, each and, each and every one of us needs to take ownership of our confession. It's responsibility of every Christian to examine for himself or herself what is being taught and to determine to the best of his or her ability whether or not the teachings agree with the plain teachings of the Bible. Fidelity to God's word is the most important qualification for determining where we worship, not music or friends or buildings or convenience or programs or tradition or dynamic preaching or any of that sort of stuff, right? Now, if you've got a choice between two faithful congregations and the other one has some of these other things that you might like, fine, okay? Um, but uh, fidelity to, to God's word is the most important qualification about where we should go to church. Uh, and we ought to, also ought to, ought to think, though, too, we ought to not be consumers about this, right? Um, you know, uh, maybe you would join the smaller church with less programs or less exciting things to do because that church needs the, your help and service and, <laughs> you know. Uh, All Saints, when, they, when, they, when we moved here, there was 30 people when they moved from uptown uh, to this location. There were 30 people. And for years, Pastor Schaff watched every family that came in the door walk in, look around, see no children, and walk out and never come back. Um, 
they wanted all the Sunday school programs and all that sort of stuff. Finally, he convinced one family to stay. And that one family jumped on every family that walked through that door, and finally they got two families to stay, right? And then those two families jumped on every family, and finally three. And there were three core families, and from there, right? So sometimes, you know, when you're thinking about where to go to church, if you've got two faithful options, maybe you go to the one that needs you more. Maybe instead of the one that has everything you as a consumer want to have in your church. Yeah. Um, we are to avoid false teachers and false doctrine. Um, this is clearly commanded, uh, Romans 16 and other places. Uh, but keep in mind, Matthew 18. It is possible that your pastor may err, and if given the loving opportunity, he may repent. Um, so, if you believe your pastor's teaching false doctrine, or even if, you, if he's preached something and you're like, I'm just not sure about that, I want to encourage you, I, I welcome that, right? Because there's, there's going to be, to, to talk to me, okay? Say, I'm not so sure about that, pastor. Because there's either two things, one of two things is going to happen, right? Either uh, you're going to learn something, right? And, and you're going to grow, uh, or I'm going to have an opportunity to repent. And, and be corrected and uh, be better, a better pastor for it, right? Um, so I think that's, you know, I think that's, uh, this is an open invitation, right? <laughs> um, uh, but if the pastor is teaching falsely uh, and persists in that, then you need to withdraw from uh, we are to keep in mind our own weakness and tendency toward having itching ears. We must resist our sinful nature. Yeah. Um, going in particular back to number three. Uh huh. Um, so you know we were talking a little bit earlier about the order of creation and you know the woman submitting to the man, this sort of thing, and, mm -hmm. you know, in different contexts. But I've heard so on the you know maybe um, taking that too far, like in respect to. Christian doctrine or even like obeying your husband. I've heard some women excuse or encourage other women to excuse bad behavior or acceptance of, you know, things that um, they were personally um, having a conscience issue with because, well, you know, the man or the pastor, it's on him if, if something's wrong and it's not your fault, so you should just go along with what he's saying. So I don't know if you could speak to that and like how to balance those kinds of issues. Yeah, so, you know, um, both in, in marriage or in, in church life, um, you know, this, uh, this idea of submission does not mean that uh, you simply just accept uh, or encourage or embrace everything that the other person does or that the, the one you're submitting to does. Um, you know, you know, um, but uh, when, when uh, so, so there may be times when you, for the sake of your brother or your uh, pastor or your spouse, your husband, uh, need to point out their sin and call them to repentance according to God's word. Now that's got to be done respectfully. That's got to be done in the right manner. But of course, that's, that's true for all relationships, right? Um, the benefit of the doubt should be given, given. The best construction should be put down. But in the end, if there's clearly a problem, then it needs to be addressed. Um, you know, I, th I thought you were going to go down this direction. Well, you know, if the, if, the, if the woman is married to her husband and her husband decides, uh, you know, I, I no longer want to be a, a, a Lutheran Christian. I want to become a Roman Catholic Christian or something like that. That she has to go along with them. Yeah, well, no, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, we are to be, in those, case, in, in those cases, we need to obey God rather than men. And that's a very hard and difficult thing to do. But we always remember that, you know, um, of course, I have to submit to, uh, to the Lord, right? Um, and, and he's the head of the church, right? Um, but so everyone, everyone has, well, I have to submit to my district president or my circuit visitor, right? Every one of us has someone that we 
submit to. But over that person, up that chain, is God. And if anyone further down that chain is acting, uh, or especially commanding you to act, contrary to God's word, we obey God rather than men. He's the higher authority. It's not forced to submission. Right, right. It's, it's, it's to be a, a glad and willful, or, you know, a, a, right. a, well, let's put it this way. It's to be a submission in faith toward God. And of course, that recognizes that God's the higher authority. Right. Right. All right. I'm not going to take you through this little survey. We're, we're running behind. So do we need to take a brief minute for a bathroom break? Or do you want to just keep plugging? Tell me. I'm fine. Not good? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, part two, the last things, eschatology, uh, let's get into it. Eschatology is the branch of theology that is concerned with the end of the world or of humankind. And we also talk about it in terms of uh, end times or last things. Uh, eschatology deals with the biblical teaching of the second coming of Christ, the resurrection, the final judgment, and eternal life in the new heavens and the new earth. Now, let me say this right at the beginning. We're not going to go into all of these different uh, uh, end times theories that are out there because it gets incredibly complicated. What I'm going to do here is give you the positive teaching of what Scripture says. We don't have time here to refute the, all of the false teachings that are in this category of teaching, all right? Uh, and certainly we don't have time to go through the entire book of Revelation and decipher all of that, okay? Have you ever heard uh, someone say, prepare to meet your maker, right? You've seen that in a movie or something like that, right? Um, uh, it's a good question to ask yourself. Are you prepared to meet your maker? Uh, who's your maker? God. God. And when will you meet your maker face to face? When it is my time to be called home. <laughs> okay, that's one scenario. Yeah. Okay, there's two, so there's two scenarios in which you might, be, uh, might meet your maker. Okay, one would be death. All right. Uh, the other would be Christ's second coming if he comes before your death. All right. Either way, it's all good. Either way, it's all good, right? So let's uh, look at death. So one scenario in which you might meet your maker is death. Uh, death, uh, in order to understand what death is, we need to understand what life is. So life is to have a body and breath. And recall uh, the Garden of Eden, God formed a body for Adam and then breathed into him the breath of life. And only then did Adam become a living being. We have that whole connection between uh, uh, breath and spirit and soul. And so uh, God spirits Adam alive. Adam becomes a living uh, uh, body and soul being. All right. So a living person is a person with body and soul. Uh, uh, death then is to have a body without breath. The body dies and the soul departs, okay? So to be, to be dead is to have the body without the soul. Um, scripturally speaking, the Bible talks about those who have died in two ways. Uh, with respect to the body, they are asleep. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians, uh, 4, 13 through 14, and many other passages, um, uh, the, those who have died in faith are referred to as those who are asleep. Okay, this is kind of interesting. It's kind of actually a really um, uh, comforting image for Christians. Uh, and it's only said of Christians that the one who's died is asleep. Right? Think about when you went to sleep last night. Can you do you know the exact moment that you fell asleep? Unless you have one of those fancy watch things that tells you the exact moment. Uh, no, you don't. You don't realize that you 
have slept until you wake up and you go, oh yeah, I guess I was slept, right? <laughs> and, I, and I think that's a comforting image. It takes, it, it, because death has lost its sting and death has lost its victory for the Christian, death is like falling asleep and waking up with the Lord. Probably won't even know that you've died until you are awake with the Lord. Death has lost its victory. Death has lost uh, so, with respect to the body, they are asleep. With respect to the soul, there are two possibilities. Uh, believers are in the Lord's presence awaiting the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. I'll let you guys read these, look up these passages later. Um, we can also uh, reference there 2 Corinthians 5, but you can also think about the thief on the cross. What does Jesus say to the thief on the cross? Today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise, yeah. Um, for unbelievers, they are separated from the Lord. And not much is said in the Holy Scripture about the current state of unbelievers who have died. Uh, we do have the account of the rich man and Lazarus, where the rich man is described as being in torment in hell. However, there's some debate about whether uh, this is a parable uh, or a historical account. Uh, um, so uh, we wouldn't necessarily want to base all of our uh, theology of death for the unbeliever on that passage alone. Um, we do hear in 1 Peter 3, 19 through 20 about the spirits in prison. Right? This is in connection with Christ's descent into hell that he went uh, to proclaim his victory to the spirits in prison. Um, so, uh, so either way, though, for the unbeliever, they are separated uh, from the Lord and awaiting eternal punishment. This state of being after death but before the resurrection is uh, called by theologians the intermediate state. And as Christians, we don't know exactly what that's going to be like. We, I mean, we. You know, I don't. I can't imagine what life would be like apart from my body. You know what I mean? Um, but thank God that's not our final home. Okay, there is going to be this intermediate state before the end, if we die before Christ returns. Uh, we know that whatever that state is for the believer, that's that we'll be blessed because we will be with the Lord, and that the unbeliever is separated from the Lord. Okay. We're looking forward to the second coming of Christ, which brings us to that second scenario. If Christ returns before you die, uh, then you will meet him, meet your maker then. Uh, Acts 1. This, uh, this is um, said at, uh, after Christ has ascended into heaven. Uh, the angels say, This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come as the in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So Jesus actually lifts up and ascends bodily and disappears in the clouds. And the angels say, you will see him return in the same way that he has departed. Uh, Revelation 1-7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. Uh, by the way, just a little note here. I said we weren't going to do too much comparative theology, but we do have the popular Tim LaHaye and this whole idea of a secret, uh, secret second coming before a third final coming of Jesus where all the believers are going to be raptured out and then there's going to be tribulation and all this sort of stuff. And the scripture is very clear. When Christ comes, first of all, ne scripture never mentions a, a, a third coming. There's always a direction towards Christ coming again. And that coming is described in such a way to indicate that, uh, that everyone will see him at once. Okay? Uh, not just the believers being whisked away, but everyone is going to see him at once. What about the timing of the second coming? Well, uh, according to Mark 13, Jesus says, No one knows the day or the hour. Um, Peter, 2 Peter 3.10, says he will come as a thief in the night. No one will be expecting it. We will all be surprised when that happens. 
So, uh, since we do not know the time of Christ's second coming, then we must always be ready. And how are we ready? How are we ready for Christ's second coming? Make sure he knows you. We <laughs> should be doing what he wants us to be doing. Okay. And waiting expectantly for him. I know I'm going to be late. <laughs> Jesus is going to be standing up there and he's going to be going like, all right, come out of the grave. Come on. Get up. Yeah. <laughs> no, so remember that we are not saved by our works and by what we're doing, by all our, our preparations or, or being ready in, in any sense like that. We are ready by living in faith, in repentance and faith every day. And by hearing and receiving the word and sacrament. That's how we're ready. Right? Uh, being Christians. <laughs> and, I'm ready. And, he can come anytime. And uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. He can come anytime. If you are living as a Christian, right? Which means living in repentance and faith and receiving his gifts. That's it. That's how you'll be ready. That's not that hard, is it? No. <laughs> You know, I think a lot of times people have this terror about the second coming. They live in dread about this, right? And I think they have that dread because they are thinking of this in terms of their works. Am I good enough? Right? Am I good enough? What's Jesus going to find me doing when he comes again? Right? <laughs> I've got a couple babies I've never laid really eyes on, and I can't wait for that day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the Catechism, there's a nice little description of the progress of what's going to happen on the last day. So let's go to uh, page 228. That's okay. I'll read it to you. All right. You can make a little note there. Uh, this is the only place in the Catechism, I think, where question number 228 falls on page 228. All right, so what will happen on the last day? Uh, here's what it says. On this great and glorious day when Christ returns, these things will take place. A, Jesus will visibly appear in glory with his angels. B, the kingdoms of this world will give way to the everlasting reign of Christ and human history will come to an end. C, the dead will be raised, the bodies of all believers, those who are alive, and those who are raised from the grave will be glorified. Uh, D, Christ will judge all people. E, Satan will be vanquished and banished forever. F, the current creation will be cleansed by fire, and the heavens and the earth will be made new again. Uh, G, we will be reunited with all those who have died in faith. H, there will be a great feast with unending rejoicing. And I, we will see God, and God will dwell with us forever. And this scripture references there, you can follow up on that and see all of those, uh, all the support for those points. But it's as simple as that, right? Um, it's, it's not going to make, you're not going to be able to make a 12 novel, you know, series to sell in Christian bookstores with that. It's pretty simple, right? We're all waiting right now. Jesus is going to come, and then these things are going to be happening. The end, right? <laughs> okay? Um, so, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the progression. Any question about any of those points? So, in fact, mm -hmm. the current creation will be cleansed by fire, the heavens and earth will be made new again. But it doesn't say where, where are we going. Are we going to be in heaven? So, or, or ah, it doesn't okay. Matter. So this is really important. Okay. And we'll talk about this a little more in a second. So let me just introduce it. You right now are a, a person who is both body and soul. Right? Um, eternity for you is going to be a body and soul reality. 
Okay. Um, so, um, where do we see this here? Let's see here. Glorified body. So the glorified bodies in C is what, is, uh, what we should talk about. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. You're going to get your body back. And you are going to live in a physical place. Right? That's what it's referring to here. That the heavens and the earth will be made new again. All right? So I think a lot of people have this idea about the afterlife, right, about, about eternal life, that forever we're going to be souls, I don't know, floating around in the netherworld somewhere with God's spiritual presence, right? But remember that Jesus still has his body, his resurrected and glorified body, right? He's not just some spirit floating around, okay? And... Uh, and we are going to dwell with him, body and soul, in the new heavens and the new earth forever. Okay? So many times, well, I'll get to that later. I, I can't stand going to funerals except my own. <laughs> well, my own funeral, but funerals that I conduct most of the time. It's a train wreck. All right. <laughs> and I'll tell you why in a minute. All right. But I want to talk about the final judgment. All right, uh, we confess the creed that he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment. Uh, and how will we be judged? Uh, John 12.48, the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. So Christ will on the last day judge all people by his word. Believers will be saved Unbelievers will be condemned. Uh, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. There's this, um, we do have time for this. Let's go to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Jesus gives here a description of the final judgment. 25, uh, Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger, and welcome you, or naked, and clothe you? And when did we see you sick, or in prison, and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So, looking at the progression of the text, uh, when Jesus comes again, he's going to gather before him all the nations, and then there's going to be a separation, like a shepherd separates sheep from goats, Okay, uh, the sheep and the goats symbolize what? Believers and unbelievers. Believers and unbelievers. Where do the sheep go? Those on the right. They go to the kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world. Where do the goats go? 
the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, which would be hell. One of the odd things about this, though, is this listing of their deeds, right? I thought we were saved by grace and not by works. And yet it seems like they're judged by their works. How do we reconcile this uh, with the rest of Scripture, which seems to be very clear that we're not saved by our works? Your works reflect your faith. Okay, that's definitely true. Uh, your works do reflect your faith, except, and yet all of us, our works are definitely imperfect right. reflections of our faith. So if, you, if you're thinking about it purely in those terms, you still have cause to worry, don't you? Yeah. So what do we do? Well, I want you to notice that the separation is made before the works are mentioned. This is really important, okay? They are first separated by what they are before any description of what they've done is made, okay? They are sheep or goats. They are believer or unbeliever. And what's awesome is this. Does, now, we know that every believer who's a, who, who, who is in heaven or who will go to eternal life is a saint sinner, right? They are, uh, they are, they, uh, to the moment they die, they were saints in Christ who were also sinners and who needed constant forgiveness, right? So, but notice that Jesus says nothing negative about the sheep. Not one thing. He doesn't say, well, you did a few bad things, but you did mostly good things, so you're in, right? It's like they were perfect. It's like they never sinned a day in their life. And why? Because he covered them. Because their sins were forgiven. Right? Their sins were forgiven. So when the recounting of the deeds comes out, there's nothing bad to say. Because he removed their sins from them as far as the east is from the west. He remembered their sins no more. And so standing at the judgment, there's only glowing praise. For the believers. Then you get to the unbelievers. Now the unbelievers certainly did many, uh, at least on an outward sense, good and noble things in their life. Some of them might have been heads of charities. They fed the poor. It could be any number of things, right? Jesus doesn't say, hey look, you, made a, you, you did a few good things, but mostly it was bad stuff, so you're out. No. He has nothing good to say about them. Why? Because they don't know him. Because as sinners, even their best and most noble deeds were tainted by sin. And because they rejected the forgiveness of sins in Christ, they are judged on the basis of them. Not on the basis of them in Christ. They are just judged on their own merits alone. And anyone who is judged on his own merits alone, there is nothing good to say. It's all been tainted by sin. When we look at the goats, we should understand that everything that is said of the goats would be said of us apart from the forgiveness of sins in Christ. Right? So, also notice this. I love this too, right? You get the sheep, the sheep, and it says all these great things to the sheep, and the sheep go, when did we do that? Right? It's like they have good works amnesia, right? They don't even know. They don't even see. They don't see these good things that they did. Again, because they were living in repentance and faith during their earthly life, right? Every, they, were, they, were, they were repenting of everything, right? Um, then you get to the goats, and what do they say? What do you mean we didn't do those things? They had this self-righteous attitude. They were trusting in themselves. They thought they were good people, and they're shocked when it's revealed that they were not. I think this account of the, of the judgment is just so telling and so beautiful and so necessary for us to hear. Well, it is now that you've explained it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's great. Um, those who trust in Christ go to eternal life with him. 
Those who trust in their own good works go to hell. And that's going to be the difference in the final judgment. And for us, there's not going to be anything bad to say because it's all been covered and paid for. There could be a third group that the, those who didn't even have the chance to refuse or accept because they they didn't they were not exposed to this or yeah, that's a good question. So sometimes that, that, uh, that question comes up. What about somebody who never had an opportunity to hear the gospel? Um, a couple of things we can say about that. First of all, um, we can't be absolutely certain that that is actually ever the case with anyone. Okay? We can't be absolutely certain. Um, we don't even, we, we can't, we have no idea what God could do in the, in the moments before death. The moment uh, as, as life is leaving the body, we have no clue, okay? So we, we ought not to, to speculate too much about what we don't know. I mean, I, I remember uh, in college, in anthropology class, there was uh, the anthropologist there, he, he, he brought up the, the case of this tribe uh, who, who lived out in the jungles in Africa somewhere and for all as far as any of the anthropologists could tell they had had no contact from the outside world at all certainly not by any uh, Christians white Christians right the missionaries had not penetrated that far all this sort of stuff so they start sitting there and they start talking to these people they start interviewing them about they learn the language and so forth and they ask them about their religious system and they believe uh, that, that God is uh, a father and a son and a spirit. And when they press them on this, they have a very rich doctrine of the Trinity, uh, even though they use slightly different terms, right? And, they, and it's all in their own language. And then uh, there's this, they believe that the son became a man and that he died uh, and was killed and that he rose from the grave. And, they, and, the, and, the, and they're astounded. How do these people know this? Well, guess what? Uh, the best theory is, is that one of those apostles made his way deep down into Africa or some tribesmen traveled the, 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 the world and found them and settled in. And these uh, tribesmen were evangelizing the neighbor tribes, right? They don't know, Emily has any clue how Christian faith got to them. God had a plan. God had a way, right? Um, so anyway, you know, we just, those are all kinds of scenarios that we just really can't know. Um, God does not say, there's nowhere in scripture that, that puts this for, scenario forward. Uh, if there is somebody who's never heard the gospel, then this is what happens. We don't know. And so we won't speak about it. We, we just can't say anything with authority. Um, we know who our God is. We know that he is just and we know that he is merciful. He's not going to do anything unjust or unmerciful in regards to those people. And so we can trust him. And the only thing I might speculate on is that maybe one of the reasons why God doesn't tell us is so that we would be more uh, motivated to evangelize. Right? That we would be motivated to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to hear the gospel. But it is a very good question. Um, and it does come up quite a bit. All right, uh, hell is real. <laughs> um, uh, it's described as eternal punishment, uh, eternal destruction. There's fire, there's suffering. Um, why do you think that a loving Jesus would speak so bluntly about hell? If you love somebody and they're in danger, you warn them, right? It's loving. It is loving for Jesus to inform us about this reality so that we would uh, 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 
try to avoid it, <laughs> that reality, right? I mean, could you imagine knowing that if you don't know Jesus, I mean, more importantly, that he doesn't know you, that you're going to, for eternity, it's not like you're just going to go to sleep and you're not going to even know that you have existed. For eternity, you're going to burn and have no relief. Just forever and ever. You know, I don't want that. Yeah. Now, some people say, well, how, oh, you know, how unloving of God to create this reality and all this sort of stuff, you know? Uh, okay. If you were gone, maybe you wouldn't arrange things this way. But you know what? This is the reality of what is. And it's loving of God to warn us about it. Um, we can't peer into God's mind and his wisdom to know why these things are. But we can know that they are. And that God has done everything possible. He has moved heaven and earth to spare you from that reality, right? Including giving his own son into death for you, all right? Um, but uh, this purpose, of, so, so one, uh, God wants believers to know about hell as a warning against unbelief and its consequences. And he uh, wants uh, the unbeliever to know about hell so that they would maybe uh, have fear in their hearts and be ready to hear of an answer uh, to this problem of death and hell. Um, by the way, we were headed for hell because of our sins, but we were rescued from hell through uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so we should understand that we were headed there because of our sin. Uh, this ought to move us to be very thankful and to rejoice for our salvation and that we would have strength in persecution. Because here's the deal, right? You, the persecutors come to you and you're faced with, uh, you're going to, you know, uh, we're going to kill you if you don't stop confessing Christ. Well, the Christian can say, well, okay, piece of cake because uh, I'd rather have that than hell, right? Um, so yeah, uh, Katie? I think it's interesting also that here, and I think there's at least one or two other places where it describes um, hell as being prepared for the devil and his angels. It yeah. doesn't say that God originally made it for humans. Yeah. But we who have followed him, you know, followed the devil, yes. <laughs> deserve to meet his same fate. Yes, that's a very good point. Right. Um, if, if we want to, that, that much we can know at least uh, from this, these descriptions, that uh, this is not, God does not wish for any of us to be there. This is the place prepared for the devil and his angels, and God has done everything to keep us from that fate. Uh, all right. How about all the people who died before Christ? They will be ghosts? Well, remember what we said, that, uh, um, that all of the Old Testament believers had faith in Jesus who was coming. They had faith in the Savior who was coming. So their, their faith is the same as our faith. They're just a different perspective, right? They're, they were waiting for the Savior to come, and they had faith in what he would do. We're just on the other side of that equation. We, uh, we have, uh, live in the accomplished reality of Christ coming and what he's done, and we have faith in what he did. So they're sheep too, right? Um, uh, Paul in Romans said, uh, points out that Abraham believed God and was justified, right? By his faith, he was justified, not by his works, by his faith. So Adam and Eve knew the promise of the Savior, and, every, uh, and, and that promise has been uh, there and available uh, for all of human history, right? All of human history is centered in, in the cross. So, we have a glorious message then to proclaim for those who fear hell. There was one who suffered death and hell in our place. He suffered separation from God when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he did those things so that we would live 
forever in God's <coughs> presence. So we don't need to fear hell. Eternal life is the great promise for believers. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So eternal life is the, uh, the promise for believers. Uh, eternal life uh, is uh, 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 described in Revelation 21. I got like five minutes left. Let me just push through. I know we're a little over time, but we start a little late. So here you go. Revelation. Let's just pretend the clock is wrong. Like it is in the sanctuary? Yeah, it's yeah. just fast. Yes. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. What a beautiful description, right? Uh, a new heavens and a new earth, right? Um, so we're talking here about a bodily reality, a physical reality, but a renewed physical reality, okay? Some have described it, and we do have pictures like this in Scripture of, uh, of, of eternal life as we'll be dwelling in a new Eden, right? We'll be dwelling in a physical world without the taint of sin. And without the possibility of sin ever corrupting it again. That's pretty exciting. Um, we might work like Adam worked <coughs> in eternal life. We might build, we might create, we might construct. We're certainly going to feast. And there'll be no sin, sin or corruption of sin to, uh, to make any of that uh, dull or boring or tedious or difficult or uh, troublesome, right? There'll be no more death, no more tears, no more crying, no more suffering. It will be a new heavens and a new earth. And to add on top of that, we're going to have resurrected bodies. Philippians 3. Christ will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. So this perishable body will be raised, recreated, renewed, restored to us, perfect and whole um, and imperishable. That's pretty awesome. So, you know, this is, this is so, uh, so important to emphasize the bodily resurrection. I told you before, this is why I hate going to funerals that I'm not preaching at. Because nine times out of ten, when I go to a funeral... It goes something like this. You know, uh, Grandma Schmidt, we're glad that she's not suffering anymore. The body's in the casket here, uh, and she is with her Lord. Her spirit is with the Lord, and isn't it wonderful and great? The end. Wrong! <laughs> no! That's not the good news! Does that sound like good news to you? I mean, it's okay, it would be great to be with the Lord, even if it was just in our spirit. But I can't understand what any of that would be like. What would it be like to be a spirit <laughs> floating around somewhere? No. No, the good news is that. I, I mean, sometimes in the funeral, especially if it's in the funeral home and there's no pulpit and all this stuff, I will walk over and I will put my hand on the casket and say, this 
body will rise again. And Grandma Schmidt will live forever just as you knew her, body and soul, except without sin, without suffering, without pain. That's the Christian hope. That's what we're looking forward to. And that's the comfort that we should be proclaiming when a believer has died. Right? Not this like, well, isn't it great? The shell is gone and buried and now she's with the Lord. That's not the full, that's not the fullness. That's not the fullness. So, um, and I've been to even worse funerals. My goodness, I've been to some. Yeah, yeah. We had this one funeral that we went to where the, the they just preached on and on and on and on about the, the the pastor was the nephew of the guy who had died, and the whole sermon was life lessons I learned from Uncle Buck hunting and fishing. So you know, you got all these stories, right? And, and Uncle Buck is a great guy, and so we know he's in heaven. The end, right? And then we go out to the graveside, and it's me and the senior pastor. And uh, we're kind of in the back, and at the graveside, they decide they're going to receive, release uh, three doves in symbol of the Holy Trinity, right? So just as they release these three doves, the other pastor goes, oh! <laughs> After all the hunting stories, we just lost it in the back row there. It was hilarious. Um, <laughs> so, Yeah. And someday, if you ask me, I'll tell you the story about the uh, fork. Um, I just don't want that one on the internet. So, oh, I've um, heard the story of the fork. Huh? I heard the story. Oh, you've heard the story of the fork? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, maybe I talked about it when we were. Yeah. No, I asked right at Everybody's heard the story. <laughs> well, I haven't heard the story. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Did I take you to the story? All right. Uh, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you this when we're not online anymore. Okay. So, based on what we've learned today, what should be our main purpose in life now? Uh, Acts 16.31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Revelation 2.10, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Uh, another main purpose in life should be to bring the gospel of salvation to others. In Matthew 24, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Mark 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. That right there. It will be preached to all the world <laughs> before the end. Um, so I can't stress this enough. I mean, it's so easy to think and to get caught up in this idea that life is about friends and family and work. Uh, you know, if you're, you're younger, like, where am I going to go to college? Or what's my career going to be? If you're older, or, or, you know, who am I going to date? Or who am I going to marry? If you're older, uh, you know, my retirement and all of these sorts of things, right? We get all caught up in all this stuff, right? Um, but we've been talking, what we've been talking today about is, are matters of eternal destiny, of heaven and hell. Um, I mean, you could meet your maker at any moment. Christ could come at any moment. Where will you go? And how many will you bring with you? Uh, there's nothing more important than God's word, than faith in Jesus Christ, and receiving the gifts in church, and sharing that word with as many as you can. Uh, there is one thing you can take with you when you die, and that's other people. Right? That's other people. Your friends and your family and your children whom you have shared the gospel with, whom you have taught uh, the word of life, right? Those you can take with you. The rest of this, retirements and all that sort of stuff, right? Houses, cars, careers, all that stuff. You can't take any of that with you. The tax shield. Hmm? The tax shield. The what? The tax shield. The, tax shield. the death shield? Yeah. So you have a big loss in one year, you get a tax shield. You know, oh, the tax shield, yeah. We can't, we can't take that either, right, yeah, okay? We can't take any of that, right? We can't take people. And so there's two purposes. There's, there's really only, the meaning of life is really wrapped up in two things. Living in repentance and faith and receiving Christ's gifts and bringing as many other people 
into that reality and taking them with us. Because everything else, everything else is going to pass away. Everything else will be destroyed in that, in that cleansing fire on the last day. Uh, so, we've got the best news ever. We've been saved from eternal death and hell. There's nothing more important than that. So, another aspect of your life now. We've completed the course. And you're done. <laughs> Um, thank you for coming and being part of this. Thank you for good discussions and questions all along. Um, it's been great. Um, uh, we will probably uh, have a new member Sunday in a few weeks. I'm going to look at the schedule and I'll email that out to you and see when that would be good to do that. Um, but... Um, because I need to talk to Ryan too, so I don't want to decide on a date right now uh, since he couldn't be here. So uh, I'm not sure if he's ready to join or not, but so we'll need to talk to him. But um, but uh, so let me talk to him, and then I'll see where everyone else is at, and we can go from there. Okay. Do you have the forms? Yeah. Form. We we um, desk. No. Then uh, I I can. I can. I, I can give you them off my desk if you just want to take. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if you if you are wishing to join the church, um, then uh, what basically basically uh, you've completed this course. If you agree with uh, what you and 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 you, this confession that we have taught to you here is also your confession. You you agree with this teaching then uh, we'd be happy to welcome you into the church as full members, communicants, and so forth. All right? If you have any additional questions, like I said, we've got a couple of weeks before New Member Sunday. Um, so if there's something, something that you're just not sure, quite sure of, something you want to discuss a little bit more before you join, let me know, and we can talk about those things, all right, before we get to that. Um, but if, if you're ready to go, I'm ready to go, okay? There's uh, copies of the uh, forms there. Uh, uh, even if you're transferring in, we'll need to get your information into the system uh, so that we can uh, have your information for our, our records. So with that, uh, any final questions or thoughts? Yes, I'd like to book you for my funeral. <laughs> uh, so when, when's that gonna be? I have I no idea. Mark my calendar. We'll have to discuss it with the Lord. Well, see, you're, you're, you're joining the church, so as long as I'm here, okay. I'm ready, you know? <laughs> Through all of this, he has let me know that there is no fear. Yeah. He knows when the time is. There's nothing I can do about it. So I'm not, I'm not a fearful of anything. I mean, like, I'm not going to go jump off of a bridge to test him or anything. Yeah, yeah. We don't want to tempt God. Right. But. But there is a confidence that we have as Christians right. that, you know, whether we make our maker now or later or when Christ comes again, we're, we're in Christ right now. That means we're good. Yeah. All right. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the lesson today. These important matters of church and ministry, the gift that you've given to us in our pastors and in our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you that we do not have to fear the last things or to fear the final judgment because Christ is our Lord and Savior. He has forgiven all our sins. They've been removed from us as far as the east is from the west. And so we, together with all uh, the Christians of all time, can pray with confidence. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Amen.